least I had hoped that we could finalize our discussion of fluids today. And then we have a break of one week. So next week there will be no lecture and then we'll go over the calculus of variations and on the basis of this discussion of nonlinear elasticity. So what I have in mind for today is uh, first of all to uh, to come to an end first with the Navier-Stokes equation and what is missing is a uniqueness proof in, in 2D. And um, as we discussed already, if we would have uh, something like that in 3D, we would be richer. Uh, like in 2D, it is possible and uh, Maybe we can ask ourselves, what is the reason uh, for not being able to do a uniqueness proof? And the, the problem was that um, mm, in the end, what we would like to do is we would like to test um, we would look look at the at, at, at the at the uh, the difference of two solutions, and of course, we would like to derive an equation uh, by inequality such that you can conclude that this differential inequality can only have one solution, namely a zero solution, meaning that there's uniqueness. And I only, will only sketch it a little bit, because otherwise I will not have enough time to discuss the to discuss uh, the, then the Euler equations uh, finally. So what is important is, is the following interpolation lemma. And this is really uh, specific for two dimension. It basically is a, it's an interpolation lemma about uh, something strange, namely uh, the L4. So. Uh, Okay, let me first write it down that we uh, see what the assertion is. So we have a domain, an open domain in R2. And the assertion is that we can interpolate for an L4 function, we can interpolate between the L2 and the gradient of L2. That is, we can estimate up to a well-known constant, square root of 2, uh, here with the L2 norm. So we go uh, below the level of space. Of course, uh, an estimate of this type could not hold without anything further. And we compensate this by a further knowledge of the gradient, also in L2. That means uh, this is an estimate for. Oh God, was this the mitte Tafel loss? This is. Lässt sich bewegen. Die lässt sich nicht bewegen, jedenfalls nicht von mir. Okay, uh, then we have to live with a little bit restricted. Uh, Blackboard space. Of course, this is for then corresponding H1 functions, actually H10 functions. Okay, I'm not going to prove this. It's really a specific proof related to, to, to D. And uh, because of this, we can now the problem is, if we do this procedure, maybe we start with the uniqueness proof here, and let's see what, what we would like to see. And let's first uh, formulate the uniqueness uh, statement. So uniqueness for Navier-Stokes in 2D. So the statement is the following. 
n equals 2. We don't need too much regularity. We only need uh, open and bounded. Nothing more, nothing about the boundary, which is also for a uniqueness proof quite natural. And uh, the assertion is we know already there is a solution, and the assertion is that this is a unique solution, a solution is unique, uh, and the meaning of the weak solution is to be uh, that the velocity is in L2, 0, T, V. V is the small space, the H1 space, as we have used it all the time, and we have, in addition, boundedness in time, if we go here to the H space. So more precisely, we work in divergence with the divergence-free uh, formulations of these other divergence-free uh, subspaces of the H1 and of the L2 correspondingly. So let's start with this proof and let's see what we still would need that we could do this proof. So, uh, abstractly written, a solution is a solution of the equation. So we have the time derivative and the, all the rest we put to the right hand side. So we have the source term, we have the linear part, and then we have the nonlinear part, which of course requires our uh, attention v, v, v. And this can be interpreted as an equation in L2, 0, T, V prime. So, uh, so what we can do here, uh, if we now test with, 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 with a derivative, then, um, and um, it's, Okay, the, we only look at the uniqueness proof, though we don't know to need, need not to know that such solutions exist at all. What we know from the, unique, from the existence proof, we only have to look at the regularity uh, of the class we would like to prove uniqueness. And that means that we now can test this V prime valued function with a V valued function capital V valued function small v, and then we know that the classical uh, product rule holds true. So uh, we know that we have, if we look at the time derivative of Vt in the H norm, in the L2 norm, this is nothing but uh, in, the, in the dual pairing, the Vt, V-valued function uh, being uh, the argument for the V-prime valued function derivative time derivative. And that's exactly the term we get if we now apply this functional to the VT. What we do, that means uh, doing so, we uh, get now first an equation. So, uh, So uh, we, we now take V1 minus V2. Vi should be solutions. Instead of, uh, of V, so for the linear part of the whole thing, nothing happens. So now for V being interpreted as the difference, we get here this time derivative of the norms, H norm squared. Um, here we also get, uh, sorry, here we also get uh, the corresponding A applied to the difference. And this is uh, tested with V. So we get here A, V, V. So we take, uh, let me say it again. So we formulate this equation for the difference and then we test with the difference. So we get A, V, V and A, V, V is nothing but the uh, V norm squared, if we say the V norm is uh, the energy norm, if we say it would be the H1 norm, then we would have an equivalency constant here too. 
So that is the linear part. And the nonlinear part is just the difference of the nonlinear term. So we have the nonlinear term corresponding to uh, V2 tested at V, and we have the nonlinear term te uh, corresponding to V1 tested at V. And this difference we have to handle somehow. And this difference, now this is quite elementary. What do we do if we have such differences? We bring in uh, mixed terms and try to combine these things. So we can write this difference We can write this difference in the following way, um, taking into account that we have a linear functional in each of the three components, only in the composition it becomes nonlinear. And uh, that's the first observation. And the second, of course, is that the V2 can be written as with the definition um, with this definition of V as, as being the difference. Hopefully V1 minus V2, not the other way around. I hope that I don't get a sign problem in. So uh, what does that mean here? So we can this express as uh, V1 minus V. Is that right? Yeah, it's correct. And we can express here uh, the V2, the V1, as V2 plus uh, V. That says the definition of the difference uh, vector. So, and now this means by bringing in, this we write, we, we take uh, advantage of the linearity of the components. So we have BV1, V2, V minus BV, that's, that's now very elementary, minus one v two v minus uh, v v two and what is that is so okay and the assertion is from all these terms so some of these terms cancel so this term cancels with this and uh, uh, here's a here's a right uh, here's a mistake. So, and, um, sorry, here's the two, mi Here are two mistakes. This is B, V1, V, V. Mm. And from these two last terms, uh, what remains is, so this term goes away. This is zero. This is basically the consideration that this nonlinear term uh, doesn't show up. Uh, so that was this was done for the case uh, here, uh, 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 V. Uh, what we did in the very beginning, uh, which basically said uh, if we test with the V, the nonlinear term vanishes due to the divergence freeness. And this also holds true in this combination. So this term is gone. And so we look ha only have this term here left. But, 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 yeah, why is this? Why is this? It will not play a role, but I'm not sure. So what I have here is, and that I do not understand at the moment, we have this term left here, but only with a minus, uh, with a plus sign, not with a minus sign, which is of no uh, further importance, which I actually don't see why this is which is of no further importance because now we will look at the modulus. And looking at the modulus, looking at the modulus means we can estimate this difference. Yeah, and now it depends, of course, of the modulus of this term here. And now we need certain estimates of uh, this combination here, where here and here the same field is, and here there's another field. And... Um, a lemma, which I not yet have stated, is 
that we can uh, bound this by a constant times the V norm times the H norm times the V norm. And now, uh, of course, we can separate this and uh, with, the, with this epsilon equation and say, okay, we get sum of squares and we put the weight to one of the, uh, one of the side and what we would like to have is that we would get here, that it, should not, it need not be an epsilon, epsilon is a, is a one, so to speak. We want to like to have this term here with a factor one and then we get another uh, factor which is furnished that this all holds uh, for the other two terms. So here we have the h squared and here we have the v2 in v squared. So why is this now sufficient? If we now look at the whole thing what we have here, um, Um, why, 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 why did I insist on in having this term here, exactly with a factor one? Because I have this term also here. And if I would have here a one over fifth, I would have like to have a one over fifth here. So it doesn't matter which, what is the factor here. I just furnished the things like that, that this term can be absorbed by this term. So this is gone. And what I have left is now a, a differential inequality for the H norm squared saying the time derivative is smaller equal smaller equal to some constant the term which I have here um, also the same quantity squared times the V2 uh, norm also in T if you want uh, Hoppla, mir fehlt eine Seite oder nicht? Now I'm missing a page, which is not good. No, it's here. Okay, now let's look at this function here, psi of t. So uh, this function is an L1 function by, by assumption. Mm, it's even, even more, but we only need, uh, sorry, it's an L1 function by assumption. This is here. This here is an L infinity function. This is this requirement here. And so, okay, here this function shows up again. Where is it? Here. So what we have is a very simple differential inequality, a linear differential inequality for a scalar function psi. Basically here with a bounded factor, time dependent factor. So if we look at the equality, then we would say, of course, this is an, 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 an ordinary, uh, linear ordinary differential equation. This has a unique, the uh, initial value problem has a unique solution. So uh, the correspondence of this uh, requirement here is the Kronwald's inequality. So Kronwald tells us that we can estimate um, that we can estimate the psi of t by some factor in which now also here the L infinity norm of this term goes in times uh, the initial data and this of course is zero uh, because at zero the, 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 two diff the two equations fulfill the initial data that is the psi of t is zero that is oops is zero that is uh, v1 is equal to v2 
So what was decisive was here this estimate here. Oops, was it not, not with a square? This estimate. And this estimate is, so to speak, the missing lemma, which now builds on this very specific estimate here. And this uh, says that um, it says that um, it's a little bit more general because here the three terms are different and we have here the situation that two are the same. And it basically says that we can estimate this quantity by something which involves the L2 norm. This would be our H norm to one half, uh, the H1 norm. This would be our V norm to one half the, from the V, we have the H1 norm. And finally, from the W and U, and here in our application, U is equal to W, so these terms should go together. We should see that the same things which are over there come up. So this term we, we have already. This is this term here. And these terms have now to go together with the other two, and they, they are ex exactly the same now for the W. So if they go together, they exactly give this, this estimate over there. OK. So as I said, I don't want to prove this now because uh, the time is a bit short. Yeah. That is only, we, we, if we talk about B, we talk about this specific B of Navier-Stokes. So V times gradient applied to V. So, so, and then we can uh, and, and test it, and then we can vary it, and we can have a general test function, and the vector field which drives the other field can be different. But the form is always this specific form. So. Okay, now uh, let's see what is the situation with the, with the Euler equation. And the Euler equation, let me remind you about the Euler equation. The Euler equation is, yeah, it's basically, it's another, let's put, the way we would look, like to look at it, this is the Euler equation. is now for inviscid flows, for ideal flows, or you like to call it, that is, we have the same model, but um, we, uh, we only have, uh, the convective part, the field drives itself. We have the pressure part as, as being an expression of, of the stress tensor, but that's it. We don't have viscous forces. And we, let's, we don't look at, at sources. Sources should be possible, uh, but that's it. So this is now in the, in the space-time cylinder, the equation. We have furthermore, we still have the divergence freeness. And as boundary condition, which is the most natural boundary condition, is that the normal component of the velocity is zero on the, on the boundary of the space-time cylinder. And then we need still an initial condition, and that is a given, we have given a vector field. Okay, so it's basically our old equation, but one term is missing here. The question is, as I said already, is this now easier? Is it more complicated? Um, it is, on the one hand, 
um, more complicated, so more complicated, because we now have here first order problem. We did the smoothing term is gone. On the other hand, the structure is, as we will see, even a little bit more pronounced. And from this structure, we will also see that this model has its restrictions, of course. So no model is the reality, of course. Or not even the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, because then you can come up and say, is this a Newton's fluid or what, what all kinds of questions one can ask, is this polar or non-polar order whatsoever. So every model we are looking at is in somewhat restricted and in the end wrong. And uh, what we here is doing, we neglect certain uh, viscous forces and we will see a certain physical consequence what this means for the model, giving the clear restrictions of that. So. Maybe we start with that, considerations, because this gives us the possibility of, uh, of, an, of, of an alternative formulation of the, of the equation which we can then use in the existence proof. Concerning the existence proof, we also had discussed this. Uh, um, what we had till now, we were lucky, so no, not lucky, but we had up to now strong results in the sense that we had global in time existence results. We had given an interval in time, maybe regularity restrictions, but no size restrictions, and we could prove existence for the full interval. This will not be possible in general for this equation here. So what we can only show for this equation is a local in time existence proof. We can show that depending on the size of the initial velocity field, that's the only data we have, there is a certain interval in time where a solution exists. What is beyond that we don't know. It might be that one can find uh, out that this interval is as small as it is, is um, depends on something which is controllable. Let me put it in this way so we can put these intervals one on top of each other, and this way coming to an existence proof, but it might well be that the solution explodes in finite time. This is, this can, we cannot exclude. So let's see uh, an, uh, an alternative formulation. And the alternative formulation is based on the concept of vorticity, which we also have uh, uh, discussed a little bit what is CT, Wirbelstärke. And the vorticity is just uh, the following quantity. So, in general, so in, let's first start with 3D. In 3D, the vorticity is also a, a vector field with three components. And it's just what we had called the rotation. So we start from the velocity field and we, we, we do the rotation of the velocity field. So what was this? This was the second derivative of the third component minus the third derivative of the second component. And then we go cyclically on. So then we have the third derivative of the first mean minus the first of the third. And then cyclically after the three, there's a one. So we have the first of the second minus the second of the first. So that's the definition. In 2D, uh, we have a, a special situation. That is the 3D situation. In 2D, uh, we can do the following. In 2D, we can, so we have in 2D, we have our first component, we have our second component of the vector field, but we have no three, third component. We could also imagine the, the, a, a 2D situation, a situation where, of course, physically there's always a third component, where the third component, we have a velocity component zero. If we do this, and if we apply this here, then you see everywhere where a third derivative, uh, so, uh, and of course there's also, maybe I have to write it in this way, it's of course it is only depending on the, on two components and not an, on, on, on three components. 
So always where there is a third derivative appearing or a third component appearing, there's a zero now. So what we get out here is, some, is a field which has two zeros and um, then in the third, of course, it's the, yeah, as it is stated, the first of V2 minus the second of V1. So actually, if we would like to define something similar in two dimensions, it's a scalar field to be interpreted as a vector being orthogonal to this plane where this two-dimensional problem lives in. So in two dimension, we define omega as a scalar field, uh, exactly what this is. And we call this, so what do we do? We, we take the gradient, so what have we done here? We take the gradient, um, it's something, let me put it in this way. Um, let me first write down the notation. So this is our omega and the notation for this is um, twisted gradient scalar with V. So what is this? The gradient, of course, it's clear what the gradient is of a function that is uh, first derivative, second derivative, let's say in 2D. The twisted gradient is just taking this vector and rotate it 90 degrees. So the twisted gradient is then um, second derivative of V minus first derivative. And so this operation we are doing formally in a scala, in a, as a scalar uh, product formulation with a V here. Therefore, this notation. Okay, so... Let's look at two... Um, the two examples, one is the rigid rotation uh, this is the field in two dimensions, so we stick now to two dimensions in our derivation because that's, that's easier to handle uh, it's the following thing, so the field is in the component, in the, in the arguments x1 and x2 is a positive factor times the uh, rotated the rotated vector, so up to a sign that's the same procedure as above here. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I have, I have a sign problem. I have a sign problem, and this helps here much more because now everything is, is consistent. Okay, so what is this? So what we do, we just turn every vector 90 degrees and um, so if we now uh, would like to plot this vector field, so uh, at every, of every vector we have the 90 degree vector and if the more we go out of the initial point this, the more the size of this vector grows, of course. We can control this a little bit with the alpha, make it a smaller or bigger, but the size is zero, of course, at zero, and then it grows going to infinity. If we now here compute the omega, what comes out is two alpha. So this vector field has the same vorticity everywhere. If we do a point rotation, or a point, a point vortex, we basically do the same thing, but we scale it with a length. That is, so if we would like to have the same length, then we have to divide by 1 over the Euclidean norm. But now we divide by, one, by, by Euclidean norm squared. That means the size of these vectors, they decrease for going to infinity and they have a singularity at x equals zero. 
And now what comes out here, if we compute uh, the vorticity, if we compute the vorticity, and that's basically something what we did already, uh, it's zero, it is zero for x, if we, if we stay away from the zero, and if we do it for the full field, in a, weak in a weak sense, then we get here something like the Dirac sum factor times the Dirac distribution at zero. So the whole vorticity is here concentrated at zero for this field. So, um, What we now would like to do is, uh, we would like to apply um, this operation, scalar multiplication with the twisted gradient, to this equation here. So in the first term, there's no problem. We uh, interchanged uh, linear operators here. Um, let's first look at this term. What, so what happens with this term? What happens with the gradient term? In principle, we know this already. Remember what this is? If we apply uh, the rotation to a gradient, what comes out? We had this computation already once. Yeah, what comes out is the zero. So if we apply this to a, a gradient function, so what do we do? We apply the negative second derivative to the first derivative. And then uh, in the second component, we apply the first derivative to the second derivative. And of course, this is zero. So if we do that, this term is gone. If we do the operation with this term, with the nonlinear term, we have, to we have to put, so to speak, the twisted, this operation, the rotation operation, on, bo on both of the components. So let's see uh, what that means. Uh, let's put it <laughs> let's put it let me first write it down what of what we are doing. So we put this this operation on uh, the uh, gradient V. So what is this? Uh, this is then V grade. So we put it on this term here. Uh, bop, bop. Sorry, sorry. Wo bin ich denn jetzt? We put it on this, on this. So we put it on this term and we put it on the first term. So let's see what this term is. This term, if you write this out, so what is this? So this is second derivative minus the second derivative. That's what we start with on v1 times first derivative of v1. Uh, minus second derivative on v2 times second derivative of v1 plus first derivative of v1 on first derivative of v2 plus second derivative of v2, second derivative of v2. So if one orders this a little bit and uses the divergence freeness, and the divergence freeness, so gradient of v is, uh, divergence of v is zero, meaning, of course, that the first derivative of v1 is minus the second derivative 
of V2. If we use this, I don't now do all these transformations, we find out that this term is zero. So this second term is gone. That means what we have now in terms of the vorticity, we have a new equation uh, which writes like the, f the following time derivative of W. Uh, this term has survived plus V plus V times a uh, gradient of omega. The P term is gone. That is, that's it. That's the whole equation. So what we now have is if we would have, of course we don't have that, but if we would have the vector field V, this is just the most simple equation whatsoever, this is the linear transport equation under this vector field. So vorticity is just transported. It's not generated by this model. And that is the restriction what this model brings in. So uh, the Euler equation has no vorticity production in it. Vorticity production can only come in if we have uh, a, a, a viscous uh, a dissipative term. So of course, if there is vorticity initially, it's transported by the given field. So and if we, uh, we can also abbreviate this, so what we have here is nothing but the material derivative, it just says the material derivative of the omega is zero. So how we can we can make a, a sort of solution procedure out of that in the two dimension? So um, we do the following. So the question is, assume we would have the omega, how can we re reconstruct uh, the, the velocity field out of that? And if we know that, then we can make an iteration out of that. If we know the velocity field, we can compute the vorticity. If we know the vorticity, we can compute the velocity field. So we have a fixed point operator uh, defined in this way. And then we have to show that this fixed point operator has, uh, has a fixed point. And this we will do by Banach's fixed point theorem. So we have to show uh, the contractivity as one of the two major properties and that means uh, uh, and then there the small time intervals comes in. The small time interval is necessary to make this operator finally uh, contractive. So let's see how this other half of the equation would look like. So we do the following. We make uh, what we would like to have is, we would like to have as an ansatz, we would like to write um, the V as the twisted gradient of some scalar field psi. And for that we define the scalar field in the following way. We solve the Laplace equation for the vorticity as a source. So this is to be understood so to speak, in for every instance of time. So time only plays here the role of a parameter. So actually this is in omega t. For every time slice we have an equation. Uh, of course we need some boundary conditions. We take zero boundary conditions and then we see what this, what this means. As an equation this is of course obviously Solvable, uniquely solvable if this omega has a certain minor regularity. Then we can be sure that this psi uh, exists uh, uniquely. So having done that, um, so first of all, the first observation is that so we, so we do these, these things together. Um, so uh, we, we define uh, the psi in this form. We define the V in this form. And of course that this all becomes consistent. Now this omega must be really the rotation, the curl of the V. This we have to check. And furthermore, what we still also want to have, we want to have this V to be divergence-free. 
So maybe we start with this. So uh, the first is the V defined in this form is divergence-free. Why? Uh, yeah, what do we, this is, okay, it's just plugging it in. So we look at the divergence of this twisted gradient, and then you see, obviously, this thing vanishes. Okay. Now, uh, let's So what do we know now? Uh, we know that omega is the Laplacian of psi. So if you write this out, that means that this we can see this we can write as the second derivative of the second derivative of psi plus the first derivative of the first derivative of psi. So this here is, but this is by definition our v1, and this is our v2. So this is just by definition the twisted gradient. Uh, no, 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 and I'm going in circles. This is just uh, the the. Do we write curl or rot? The rotation. What did that do? Rot. Okay. This is yeah. It's it's the twisted gradient of 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 V, it's, uh, and in this sense, it's the rotation of V. So, so the things come together. So now, uh, this is the set of equations we have to fulfill. It's, for, it's coupled. So if to, to compute the vorticity, I need to know the V. And to compute the V via the psi, via this, this twisted potential, I need to know the vorticity. Okay, so this is in 2D. Let's have a look what the difference in 3D is. The difference in 3D is that this equation here is wrong. So this does not hold. All, all the other things what we did are okay in 3D, but this does not hold in 3D. So that means if we now write down this, this equation, it's not just this equal to zero, but this term here, uh, sorry, this, this term is still, is still there. That means, uh, yeah, what is this here? This is omega. So we have a term omega times the gradient of V. So we have here, so to speak, on the right-hand side, something like... Uh, it's, it, sorry, it's mine. There's somewhere is a, a sign confusion. It's a minus omega times gradient of v. So I have here uh, omega times gradient of v. So here, this was a pure transport equation. Give me some vorticity field, and then having this velocity field, say it's constant, it's only shifted through with constant velocity, otherwise it's shifted through with this given velocity. Now, what does this say? It says this is not the case. Uh, there is a source term. But the source term is zero if omega is zero. So this still says, um, the vorticity can grow along, uh, let me put it another way. Maybe you remember the notions of characteristics. And this we will use in a second. So this just means the solution is constant along characteristics. So the data which is given by a t equal to zero for the omega is just transported. So this says, it's also transported along the characteristic the equation re it, it, it reduces to an ODE, but with a source term. So it can grow if there is something, but it cannot come to existence. If there is nothing, then there is no reason why omega should come, become non-zero. So there is no vorticity generation, but there is a sort of a possible vorticity enhancement. It's also called the tornado effect. 
So that makes it the analysis of the 3D case a little bit more complicated because one has to handle this additional term. And that's why we restrict ourselves to 2D. And I think this is now enough, which we need to know uh, to step into the uh, existence proof. So uh, what we are going to do is we now look at the Euler equation in the vorticity form and try to show at least the existence of a, a local in time solution. So this, first of all, the definition of the equations we are going to look at. Uh, maybe I ignore this blackboard. So we have the Euler equation in vorticity form. So that means we have some time interval, which we have to make smaller then. We have some domain in Rn, n2 or 3. Uh, so we are looking for functions v at omega. Um, OK, so what, what, what? Uh, these are to be the solutions of uh, let me first write the equation. So that is what we had found out. So that is the form. And then depending whether we have 2D or 3D, we have nothing or we have this term omega times gradient V. So we restrict, we restrict ourselves to these two cases. So then furthermore, we would like to have that we have divergence freeness. And then the relationship between these two should be that the rotation of the V is the omega. So this we require in omega uh, for almost every G. Then we still need the boundary condition. That was the normal boundary, the normal component is zero. So that means uh, we have to interpret these equations differently in two and three dimensions, but we restrict ourselves only to two dimensions. In two dimensions, that is omega is uh, from QT, is a scalar equation for two dimensions. And for three dimensions is a, uh, is a vectorial equation. And the vector field V is, of course, yeah, OK. It's, of course, uh, Rn. So that's it. And uh, still the regularity we would like to have for the solution. So we would like to have, uh, so we're looking for a solution of the class where the velocity is L2 in H1. So this is quite natural because we have first derivatives. And for the omega, um, we have, oops, um, we have to see how this is to be interpreted. So we only require L2, L2. So the derivatives which come up here, here, and here, they have to be, be interpreted in the, distributional, in the distributional sense. So what we did is, the what we did up till now was a formal considerations because we just manipulated the equations and not looking whether in which sense these terms have to be understood. So we came, we did this step from the classical formulation, from the pressure, from pressure velocity formulation to the uh, vorticity uh, velocity formulation. This we did already. Actually, these two formulations are equivalent. And 
And um, so what, what does that mean? One has somewhat, so uh, what is so to speak missing is, is the pressure function. So we have to define somewhat a pressure function. Yeah. Similar, this is a sort of similar to the, to the different formulation of the, of the Stokes problem. Um, and the statement is the following. The proof requires a certain regularity uh, results. Um, so the proof requires uh, a lot of regularity on the domain. So N always means I do not uh, write this down anymore. N is always two or three. So what do we require? We require that is C2 bounded. That's quite a lot. And it can be relaxed. If you know a little bit of regularity theory for elliptic equation, you can relax it because, of course, this does not allow for any corners or something like corners. Uh, you can allow, actually, for, corner, for, 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 for vertices. Um, if you take into account something like convexity and you're on the safe side if you consider, uh, if you consider uh, parallel epipeds, a square in 2D or a, parallel or a, a cube in, 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 in 3D. Any case, we leave it like that, but it can be, can be relaxed. So the assertion is if we have a solution of the Euler equation vorticity type, so to speak, then, and we have corresponding regularity, and the regularity with what we need is that this W is an L2H1 function, so this, the equation not only has be understood in, 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 in a distributional sense, the transport equation, but really in a, in a, in a strong also setting. And uh, for the critical nonlinear term, we would like to know that this one is L infinity 0 T uh, H1. So this is a little bit uh, difficult to check. And the uh, assertion is then there exists a P, a pressure function, which is from L infinity 0 T H2. Uh, such that this pair now is a solution of the Euler equations with pressure. The classical formulation. Okay, I will only give a short indication of the proof. And what the proof does is, it's also something which is very helpful in conjunction with, with uh, fluid dynamics problems, which we have not so much uh, looked at is the so-called Helmholtz decomposition. That means if we have a vector field of uh, there are various, various versions of this theorem, it basically says there is a vector field and this vector field can be decomposed in a part which is a gradient field and in a part which is divergence free. And you can do this for L2 uh, for fields where the components are L2 functions with the corresponding notion of what that means, what I just said, or you could do it for H1 functions or things like that. So this is what we are using. So, uh, so what we are doing is under this assumption, so what we have in general in the notion of solution is this here, is L2 H1, which we can use so we look uh, for a field, so we define, um, or, or let me put it in the other way around. So uh, what we would like to have for the V, we would like to have this part of the equation, this equation, um, plus a gradient term. So. Um, So 
So, um, what was this not W? So the gradient term has somewhat come out of this uh, this this, this nonlinear part. So we now uh, def look at this nonlinear function. And this is for every instance or almost every instance in time by assumption, this is now an H1 function. And by Helmholtz, Helmholtz tells us, in the way I, I, I sketched this, Helmholtz tells us I can, this, I, I, I can subdivide this uh, f in a new, unique fashion in a vector field W, in a gradient field, gradient of some function P, where this W is an H1 function. And it's divergence free. And the P is an the P is an H2 function. So then I have here an H1 function, so that is the version for H1 function. As I said, there are all kinds of other versions too. Okay. So uh, we now would be ready if this W would be, uh, so what is still to show is that this W is the time derivative of V. If this would be the case, we would have an equation, time derivative of V plus gradient of P plus the, the, the convective term equals to zero, the Euler equation. And divergence, um, okay, we have then to see still, but this we have already, the divergence freeness of the V we have and the boundary conditions we also have. So that's the only thing which is left to show. And uh, this we can do in the following, with the following reasoning. Um, we compute, we look at the difference of these two equations. We could look at the difference of these two equations. So we look at time derivative of V minus, uh, minus W, and we compute the rotation of this. And uh, what comes out, I'm not now skip a little bit the details, what comes out, this rotation is zero. So that means we have here a distribution with a vanishing rotation. And what, what we in addition have, we have uh, a function which has uh, vanishing normal components. So why is this? We have it for the V and therefore also for the time derivative. If we go along, uh, so all these values are zero, then of course also the time derivative is zero. So we have it for this, and for the W, uh, we also have it, we also have it, why do we also have it? Because this is a part of the Helmholtz decomposition, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's not only divergence-free, but it also has, yeah, I put it in here, it also has normal component zero on the boundary. So this is also then, so to speak, this function in the normal component is also zero on the boundary. Okay. To make, this is all time dependent still at the moment. We would like to have a non-time dependent uh, function. So what we do, we integrate all the stuff over time times some test function. Times some test function. Um, and the test function is a C1 function with compact support. And here is the, 
it's only a scala test function. So all these properties maintain. We can go with the rotation. We can throw through the time integral with this product. We can go through the time integral. So the set is now rotation free. We are on a corresponding good domain, and then we know a rotation-free function. We discussed this already, and we uh, we, we need um, we need a. U I, I'm a little bit confused because, according to my remembrance, we need that the domain is simply connected, which we don't have assumed here irrespective of how smooth the boundary is. So maybe to be on the, sa on, 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 uh, on the safe side, maybe it's not necessary, but I think it is necessary. We need that this is simply connected. Then uh, we, we know that the set has a gradient. So it can be written as some gradient of phi. Then because of the regularity of the set, the phi is h2. I abbreviate a little bit. And uh, what does that mean? That means now uh, for the set, if uh, use the divergence freeness, we have Laplacian of phi equals zero. We have the trans the, the, the boundary conditions, uh, the normal boundary conditions um, also transfer phi. Uh, yeah, it's, it's now it's now not uh, uh, it's it's now a, a Neumann boundary condition. So this is now the the derivative of phi in the normal direction, which is zero on the boundary. So we have a pure Neumann we have a new pure Neumann condition, and we know the Neumann problem is uniquely solvable up to a constant. But uh, so if the phi is a constant and the set is a zero, and if the set is a zero, and this we can control now, this variation which comes on in over the, over, the, over the test function, so we can, so to speak, concentrate where we want in this time interval. So it's not possible that uh, there are some parts which then may level out. Uh, because we can put a corresponding test function in, and the corresponding means that also this integrand must be zero, that we really have this identity in the distributional sense, and that's what we needed. Okay, let's see what we can do with the last 20 minutes. Um, maybe I skip this with the these considerations of the of the uh, conservation uh, quantities and come directly to the to the uh, existence proof. Can only sketch it a little bit. So our final theorem on that is now local existence for the Euler equation. So we, we know that in some sense these two formulations are equivalent under certain regularities at least. And then we, uh, what we are going now to show uh, a local existence for this vorticity formulation. The drawback, okay, here it comes. For some reason now it's here in the assumption, the omega is here really now bound, not only bounded, but simply connected. So maybe I was not so wrong in adding this there. And now we need quite some regularity for the boundary. That is the drawback. We need a, regu a boundary which is at least, which is at least uh, C4. Actually, we have something m plus 1, and m is greater or equals to 3. That is, of course, quite a requirement, but we can also say, okay, what is a boundary here? Then we, 
make the edges, the, the vertices a little bit smoother and then it will hold. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a modeling point. Is, is the domain, is it really, is the domain something decisive? And if you look at a piece of metal, a specific piece of metal or a specific piece of a motor block, of course, the, the, the geometry is absolutely decisive and it's certainly not C4. Or if you have some, let's say, environmental problem where the domains are more or less uh, artificially defined, then you would say this is not such... If it's such an, a rigorous requirement if you have some flow problem in a channel or something like that. So it depends very much on the applied problem whether this is a, a severe restriction or not. So initial data have the same regularity, same discussion, uh, already divergence free with normal component equal to zero. And the uh, uh, assertion is there exists an instance of time depending on this initial data, what else, and some constant C such that uh, there's a solution in the sense in the regularity defined um, yeah vp but we do it via the other formulation and uh, we have the following regularity for the velocity it's l infinity in time HM, so this initial regularity which we invest here, this is preserved. So we are talking here about very smooth solutions which are controlled by the corresponding term of the initial data. Okay, so, and I said already, this at least we can define. Uh, actually, maybe it's already clear how this fixed point iteration looks like. So we take a, we do a fixed point iteration in the vorticity. Okay, so how does this uh, does this work? So we define a mapping. So we define a fixed point mapping. So we start with some, let's say, omega hat. So this is just some, some vorticity field, which is supposed to be in, this is an abbreviation yet now, uh, x m minus 1. So this is supposed to be the L infinity in time h m minus 1 in space functions. So, and what we want, would like to, pro to show, to, we would like to map this to some omega, such that the fixed point of this mapping is actually a solution of the problem. So, and how do we define this? So, first, in the first step, we define uh, define uh, a, ve a velocity field. Okay, how we do this? Um, we solve. As we have seen, we solve the Laplacian uh, with this given with this given field. So this is uh, an elliptic problem, but has a look at it also with an uh, with a time as a parameter. So this is time only plays the role of a parameter. Um, at the boundary zero. So 
So this is in omega. So if we have this psi, so give, give, sorry, not, not, not var, but hat. If we have given this omega hat, we get this psi. From this psi, as we have seen, we get the v at the twisted gradient of the psi. And, okay. Now let's see in which spaces we are. Here, because of this enormous regularity, we also uh, have in the, in the, in the, in the, in the domain, uh, we have this best, this maximal regularity theorem, that means we just go two steps higher. Here we are at m minus one, here we are at m plus one. Uh, now we do, do a gradient again, that means here we are now in, uh, at the level m of derivatives, so we call this the space ym because it's now uh, a vectorial space, but it's basically the same thing uh, with, L, uh, with hm omega, but now with vectors as values. So now we have the velocity field. And now with the velocity field, we can define the omega. And this we do by, uh, I restrict myself now to 2d. In the other case, we would have this additional term. This we do by solving this uh, linear transport equation. Um, and of course we need some initial data and the initial data are the uh, given initial data, so to speak, computed out of the, uh, the given initial data. And the given initial data, omega zero, are those which are compatible with the given velocity data, V zero, that is, that's just the curl of this velocity field. So we have the v, now we can compute the omega. Now with the omega, and now you see if this omega is the same as the omega hat here, then this is the set of equations which we have seen was equivalent to the classical formulation. So we have to uh, have defined the fixed point <coughs> equation. Okay. There is a little bit of a technical problem now. What we would like to do is we would like to look at this equation here uh, in terms of characteristics. So we would like to define, given the velocity field, uh, the flow passes, uh, the, 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 how did we call this in English, in English, the Bahnen, <laughs> whatever this is, the, the trajectories, the, tra the trajectories, and along, the tra the, along those trajectories, the solution is then constant given by the initial data. The problem is now that the regularity in V is missing. So what we have to do is we have to bring in an approximation step. So um, we have to uh, approximate these psi's by correspondingly smooth functions such that the v's are smooth enough that we could do that. This is a technical problem which I now will, and of course we have to see that we can go through this additional limit. I ignore this problem now and um, We do the following. We have the trajectories. That is, we have, uh, so to speak, passes from omega t going to uh, omega. Uh, that is, we have x is something like x of a capital X. That's where we start. It's basically this what we did looking at the Eulerian and Lagrangian coordinates. And uh, what we do is we monitor what this initial point, so initially we start at this 
material point capital X and now we see what happens with this material point under the action of this velocity field uh, which we have. Mm, that, 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 comma t. So, and this is now, as I said, not really correct. What we actually, actually we have something like x epsilon in which we get a v epsilon in which we uh, get a psi epsilon to make sure that we have here uh, enough, uh, we have continuity that we can talk in a classical sense of this uh, ordinary differential equation. So, but let's ignore this. And, uh, okay, we start now. Uh, now we can write down the solution of the transport equation on the transported, the other way around, on the transported material, po at the transported the trans material point, we have the same value as we had originally for t equal to zero at the material point. Okay, so this basically gives the well-definedness of this, uh, of this uh, mapping and now we, have to, uh, now we have to show two things. We have to find a set, a closed set in, this, in the corresponding space here, which is mapped into itself. That is one requirement of the Banach's fixed point theorem and we have to show the contractivity. And, um, okay, for this, of course, we need, again, uh, a, posteriori, uh, a priori error estimates. And um, let me see how I can squeeze this within three minutes. Um, okay. How to argue like that? So, um, so what do we, do we want to do? So we want to estimate the W in uh, such a norm here. Let's do it for the most simple case for M equal to three, but for M equal to three, we still have an H2 norm here. So we need spatial derivatives of the W. Okay, for g getting, so we need a, a priori estimates. Mm, for this it would be the case m equal to three for uh, uh, omega in H two. So we need a first and a second derivative. So what can we do? We can just take the equation. Where is it here? And uh, put. Uh, say, for, uh, let's start with the first derivative, put a first derivative in it. So this is not a problem. Here we get an additional term. So we get the first derivative here, we get it here. Okay, uh, and then we do the same thing with the second derivative. This basically means that um, we have also to control, we get also derivatives of the V in in this process and we have to control these derivatives. And at the end of the day, uh, yeah, and I really have, really have to shorten that, at the end of the day, we can, there's really something in between, we can show something of this type, we get an estimate, and there's also a, a Cronwall step in between, at, at least uh, at the, in, the, in the end, we can estimate the L infinity norm of this in H2, that is what we want, by some constant, and then there's a constant here of the type, uh, of the type um, e to some constant times t. And then here we get our starting norm. Uh, 
I said the first thing what we need, uh -huh, okay, I think I can generate myself a new blackboard in this way. Yeah? I haven't thought of that. Okay, so where is this C bar from? This is for, this is for, uh, so to speak, starting fields for omega hat fields such that omega hat in the same norm, that's the norm of our space, is bounded by C bar. So the ball with the radius C bar is a candidate for the set, for a bounded set, which is mapped into itself. That this is really true, we, of course we have to make sure that this is here, this whole thing here is less or equal to C bar. And uh, the C1, what do we know about the C? And this we can, can, can do not for every C bar, but for a specific C bar. We choose a C bar, just this constant which we have here, and we give it a little bit room. So we take the 2 C1 times this H3 norm. That means, uh, uh, that means we have here something like with this, and this, we have something like one half C bar. And now, the only thing is that this has to be less than two. Of course, these, these numbers are arbitrary, could be also different. So if we now, we cannot allow for every time interval, but we, if we make the time interval small enough, we get the self-mapping property. It's not yet the contractivity, we also need it for the self-mapping property of the set. And then the final step is the contractivity. Because we have a nonlinear problem, it's, some, it's a little bit different from just saying it's, uh, it's the, upper, uh, the, 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 the a priori estimate. Now we really have to take two, uh, two arguments, two omega hats, and look at the, uh, what the mapping does and look at the difference of the thing. Uh, so basically, we have to look uh, what this equation is then for two different. So the first step is linear with the definition of the psi and the definition of the v. Here, the nonlinearity then comes in with a v1 and a v2. So we have to look at these equations for omega 1 and a v1 and omega 2 over v2. Look at the difference of this. And here again, uh, we see then finally we get an estimate. Maybe I write it in this form. That was a little bit stupid. Actually, they are for blackboards. Uh, okay. So we need the contractivity. So we have an omega hat one, omega hat two, goes over to the corresponding psi i terms goes over to the v i terms goes over to the w i terms and uh, as I said if we look at the difference of these two equations we get something like finally I abbreviated now an estimate in uh, and now there's a little bit of a problem namely the problem is it's not the norm which we would like to have we get the contractivity here in the norm, which actually in this abbreviation, maybe I use the abbreviation, is only the X0 space and not the X2 space. It's only L2, L2, not L2, H2. Only without the derivatives, we can estimate this here with a new constant times time interval length times the difference of the arguments. So if we ignore this problem of the different norms for a moment, then we would say, okay, we are done. If we take t small enough, we have a contract, we have a contraction. Now we have a little bit of problem with the norm. And there's a variant, I had to admit I also did not know that this exists, but it's quite easy to prove. There's a variant of the uh, Banach's fixed point theorem. It's called the Banach's fixed point theorem with two norms, 
where you argue with two different spaces. A large space, this is this X0 space here, and a small space, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, X2 space. And if we can show, what, what does it basically say? If we are able to show that uh, if we are in both of, we have balls in, in both norms, and we can show that uh, the intersection of both boards is mapped in the same in, 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 in the corresponding intersection, which we could do with a variant here, then it's only necessary to prove the contractivity in the larger in the norm of the larger space. What we have done here. Okay, that's it. And I think uh, with this we close the fluids and then we go then from in two weeks we then go to the solids.